Middle ear barotrauma is by far the most common dive injury. Although painful, most of the time the injury is not serious, and diving can often be continued as long as the diver can clear the ears easily. Deafness, dizziness, or ringing in the ears should always prompt medical assessment. A common description of middle ear barotrauma is a sense of fullness in the ear, or like talking while wearing hearing protectors. Some also describe a feeling of water in the ears. If the feeling of fullness persists after you have shaken your ears or dried off, most likely the fluid buildup is not in the outer ear at all, but rather in the middle ear, and thus eardrops will do nothing to clear out that fluid. As we discussed in the Dive Medicine for Divers section on barotrauma of the ears and sinuses, you know that when the middle ear isn't equalized properly or the eustachian tube is blocked, the body will attempt to equalize that pressure differential within the middle ear space by filling it with fluid or blood. The otoscope is an important tool in helping to visualize the eardrum and determine if there has been trauma to the middle ear. Um, it's, what you can do is basically look in your diving partner's ear after a dive. Okay. You should not attempt to diagnose barotrauma yourself. But learning to use an otoscope and looking at the tympanic membrane of normal ears will help you to recognize when there may be a problem with a fellow diver's ears and when that diver should seek out the advice of a physician. I'm going to pull towards the left, kind of press to the left and go straight in. But basically when By using an otoscope, you can evaluate the external ear canal and the eardrum. You can make some determinations about the middle ear as well. If the eardrum is bulging outward, it means the pressure in the middle ear is raised. Similarly, if it is sucked in, it suggests a negative pressure within the middle ear space. Fluid in blood may also be visible as a fluid level against the drum, or there may even be bubbles visible behind the eardrum. The external ear consists of the pinna, which is the fleshy part of the outer ear. In front of the ear canal is a lump of cartilage covered with skin called the trachus. This becomes very sensitive or painful when there is an outer ear infection. The ear canal leads toward the tympanic membrane or eardrum. The primary function of the pinna and canal is to collect sound and funnel sound toward the eardrum. The external ear canal is very sensitive to pain and has nerve branches that may cause fainting or coughing when irritated. It is for this reason that we recommend having the person being examined in the sitting or lying position. This is not looking good. When visualizing the eardrum, you should see a flat, circular membrane with a prominent bulge in the upper middle portion. This bulge is formed by the malleus, or hammer, and is one of three bones known as ossicles. The other bones are named the incus, or anvil, and the stapes, or stirrup. These bones connect the eardrum to the inner ear, and both conduct and amplify sound from the eardrum to the fluid-filled chamber of the inner ear. The bulge itself, halfway up the stem of the malleus, is called the lateral process because it sticks out to the side. This is an important landmark and always projects in the direction of the nose. Another important landmark seen along the anterior inferior aspect of the drum is the light reflex. This is actually just a reflection from the otoscope light and it is also on the same side of the drum as the lateral process. There are a number of different things you can tell about the ear by using an otoscope. You can see middle ear barotrauma seen here as bubbles behind the eardrum. Wax impactions that may look bright yellow or dark brown black like blood clots. You can also see bony spurs and growths called extoses. 
and osteomas, also known as surfer's ear, or signs of infection such as with swimmer's ear. Middle ear barotrauma is the most common dive injury, so it is useful to know what it looks like to have a way of grading the severity. Remember, a layperson should never attempt to diagnose a medical condition nor offer medical advice on diving fitness in the presence of an abnormality. However, a layperson may be able to recognize a normal looking eardrum that is able to move during equalization attempts. Well, that's really neat, that's cool. You see it? Yeah. What does it look like? Yeah, actually kind of, it's Boeing. You can see the eardrum actually Boeing. You got it, that's right. In 1944, during the Second World War, an ear, nose, and throat surgeon by the name of Wallace Teed described the appearance of middle ear barotrauma in submariners. His classification has since been modified, but is internationally known. Teed scale zero refers to someone complaining of blockage or fullness of the ear without any evidence of injury upon examination. This condition usually improves spontaneously within 30 minutes to 24 hours, and the use of decongestants is optional. This usually occurs in divers that are unfamiliar with the experience of equalizing, yet have not experienced any difficulty in doing so effectively. Teed 1 is the first classification of ear barotrauma. A diver suffering from middle ear barotrauma grade 1 will present with complaints of blocked ears and upon examination all that can be seen is hyperemia or engorgement of the blood vessels over the stem of the malleus. In some cases the eardrum may be slightly retracted or bulged. This represents mild irritation rather than actual trauma. Again this is a self-limiting condition that settles in less than a day. The use of decongestants is optional. Teed scale 2 represents the first actual evidence of trauma or bleeding. The history is commonly one of pain during descent which may persist afterwards. The diver will usually have experienced failed efforts at equalizing. On examination, small areas of pinpoint or streaky hemorrhages may be visible, usually immediately adjacent to the stem of the malleus. As long as the diver is able to equalize, this condition usually resolves within 48 to 72 hours. The use of decongestants, while previously optional, is now indicated to assist drainage of the middle ear space and reduce tension on the eardrum. Teed scale 3 barotrauma represents even greater trauma, with plaque-like or patchy areas of hemorrhage. Pain is a more prominent feature of this type of barotrauma. Treatment commonly consists of decongestant use. The condition usually resolves spontaneously within four to five days without complications. Teed scale four barotrauma is recognized by pain, fullness, and upon examination, fluid or blood is seen behind the tympanic membrane. Bubbles can sometimes be identified. This form of barotrauma indicates a slow, continuous increase in pressure or sustained inadequate pressurization of the middle ear. It is typically seen in divers that slowly yet persistently force their way down at the threshold of pain. The presence of blood or an upper respiratory tract infection usually prompts the addition of antibiotics, even cortisone, to the standard regimen of analgesia and decongestion. This usually clears within five days to two weeks. The presence of blood behind the drum may persist for several days, but should resolve. Teed scale 5 barotrauma is recognized by perforation of the eardrum with or without any of the other features of barotrauma. A diver with this type of barotrauma often describes increasing sharp pain accompanied by a dull popping sound, followed by relief of pain as the tension on the eardrum is relieved. Frequently, an episode of extreme dizziness follows as cold water rushes in and contacts the inner ear. This is called caloric vertigo. Fellow divers may notice bubbles coming out of the injured diver's ears when they equalize. And there is usually some deafness upon return to the surface, frequently followed by severe pain some two to five hours later due to an inflammatory response to the water. The most common doctor-prescribed treatments for perforations, depending on the size of the perforation and whether or not it becomes infected, include pain medication, decongestants, and antibiotics. 
Some may heal within a few days to two weeks, while others will need reconstructive surgery, called a tympanoplasty, to repair the damage. All these different degrees of barotrauma may appear rather confusing, but the principles of management remain rather simple. Whenever you observe any problem with the eardrum using an otoscope, refer to medical evaluation. Do not attempt to diagnose or medicate an injured diver yourself. To use the otoscope, hold it in the same hand as the ear you are about to examine. Right ear, right hand. Place the otoscope in the palm of your hand facing upwards with the head of the otoscope on the side of the pinky. Grasp the otoscope with the thumb and the ring through index finger, leaving the pinky free to support the otoscope against the cheek of the person being examined. The external ear canal is S-shaped. To straighten the ear canal and to make it easier to insert the otoscope, pull the external ear upwards and slightly backwards. When inserting the otoscope, which should be done under direct vision through the lens, pull slightly forward with the speculum, i.e. the spigot-shaped barrel, to move the trachis out of the way and then guide the otoscope gently slightly backwards and upwards until you can see the tympanic membrane. Always remember to use a clean, fresh specula for each ear and for each different person. This will avoid the transmission of infection from ear to ear and of blood-borne pathogens from person to person. Scraping of the ear canal can release blood. Never insert the otoscope into the ear canal blindly. Guide the speculum into the ear under direct visualization. Both you and the diver should be seated as stimulating the nerves in the ear canal can cause coughing and fainting. Remember that the ear canal is very sensitive, especially when there is an infection, so be careful and stop immediately if the person feels pain.